Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are watching from. Welcome to the second series in this um, series of Dean's webinars, Business as Unusual, Careers in a Crisis. In the midst of the pandemic, we've seen some of the highest rates of unemployment or non-employment since the Second World War. Some people have lost their jobs, some have been furloughed, freelancers and zero hours contract workers are experiencing work volatility of a kind we've simply never seen before. So let's be honest, this is a very, very tough time. It's a time for all of us because there's incredible uncertainty about which jobs will remain, how much worse unemployment will become, which industries will come back when, and um, where the path is to some kind of stable or predictable career. But uncertainty always has two faces. One is completely confused because we don't know what the future holds. And the other one is excited because not knowing what the future holds can mean that the future is ours to make. Which also means that a lot of people at home right now with time to reflect are asking themselves whether they might want to do something different with their lives. And the pandemic has been a really visceral reminder that we're not going to live forever. So how do we want to spend the precious time that we have? What kind of work will give us meaning? So everything's changing. And you're not alone. We brought together a fantastic array of talent and energy and experience to talk about options what's available, how to think about your future, what to do, and perhaps what not to do. My hope is that this session will be informative, inspiring, and pragmatic. It will give you some ideas, it will give you some hope, and it will help you kind of think more broadly and practically about what it is you want to do or could do next. Because after all, whichever way you look at the world, there is plenty of work to be done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce each of the panelists and ask uh, um, to present them with the questions that you've asked using the chat function at the bottom of your screen. So please, as we're going along, please feel free to type in any questions you have. If you want to direct the question to a particular panelist, let me know. Um, otherwise, I'll direct the questions to all of them. So let's get started. It's my real pleasure to introduce Vincenzo Laporriere. He is a finance director at Hayes Recruiting and has a really broad overview of what's happening in the employment market today. Mm -hmm. So Vincenzo, um, could I ask you first of all to give a kind of overview as to what you see happening in the recruiting business from your perspective at Hayes? Yes, Margaret, thank you um, very much for inviting me and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as you said, uncertain times, uh, however, we, we, we thrive, we, we should all thrive in this, uh, in this kind of uncertainties. There are opportunities out there. Um, as, as already you also mentioned, we, we came into this uh, trading environment uh, already under pressure as global markets were slowing down, the trade spat between China and the US was escalating. We had another general election. We still have Brexit in the background. So there's a lot of things going on, uh, even before the pandemic uh, took, took place. So, so things weren't exactly booming before then. What we have seen since, what's happened since, is that basically the economy, as you said, is shut down. Uh, it's put in hibernation by, by the government. And unsurprisingly, hiring has pretty much come to, to a halt. Uh, and there's, there's a serious threat, uh, as, as you mentioned, that... Uh, uh, unemployment rates uh, will more than double by September, October, as the furlough scheme, medium or, or, or small, uh, has seen a bit more of an impact than uh, the public sector, uh, which has, has had more government support effectively. And uh, as, as we've seen, um, uh, Boris Johnson, the, the PM, has announced yesterday there will be more money uh, for public sector projects, which should benefit the, the, the broader uh, economy. Uh, if we then were to look across sectors, unsurprisingly, IT and uh, pharmaceuticals uh, have been more uh, resilient than, than some of the other sectors. Uh, those that have had a bit more of, of, uh, uh, of, of an impact include things like construction property, 
although most sides have, uh, have now reopened and, uh, and I'm expecting a relatively strong comeback from, uh, from that sector. So not all sectors have been it the same. Not all sectors will, will come back in, in, in the same manner. Um, what is fair to say, I'm, I'm not expecting at this stage, is the so-called V-shaped recovery. Um, that sort of bounce back is, is not forecasted to, to be happening at the moment. Um, one of the more trendy ways that I've heard uh, the, this recovery uh, being described as is, is now like a Nike's whoosh. So yes, we've had a, a bit of a dip. It won't come back uh, roaring uh, as, as such, but there will be, uh, depending across sectors, there will be various uh, speeds at which they uh, recover. Right, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you, Vincenzo. Um, in ter do you have any sense of particular sectors that are busier in terms of hiring throughout the pandemic? I mean, I understand that the tech sector has been hiring throughout the pa pandemic. Are there any others that have, you know, not completely sort of faded away? Um Within the space we operate in, we operate in the specialist recruitment sector. So this is where any, any, anything with some sort of qualification, uh, as opposed to, to the blue collars or the assembly line sector. Uh, we have seen uh, a lot of resilience, yes, in across all IT spaces, um, across pharma, but also across social care, for example, which um, sometimes it's not thought as a, as, a, as a glamorous career, but think about that within social care, there are still cross elements. So you still need an IT manager, someone to support your IT architecture. Uh, you will still need support services to make sure that the infrastructure uh, of the social services provision uh, can function. So there are broad aspects of, of, of uh, various sectors that although uh, are under, under some sort of pressure, there are pockets of growth within those. Right, right. And in terms of the people that you're seeing who are job hunters, um, how flexible do you find that they're willing to be? I mean, I was just thinking as you were talking about the care sector, you know, and today we've heard a lot of news about um, Cafe Ritazza and Upper Crust laying off thousands of people. It, how easy is it to kind of slide from one sector to another? Because it strikes me that hospitality and care are perhaps not extremely different from each other. How flexible are employers being and how flexible are job hunters being? Yeah, so, so I, th I think we need to um, differentiate between, uh, again, to sort of blue, blue collar and, and so-called white collars. There are inevitably a lot of skills that are transferable. Uh, so we've seen uh, a, a lot of airline uh, crew members who have taken on jobs in customer service, for example. Um, so no doubt you can transfer those skills across. The, the level of flexibility that we're talking about also is, um, it, it kind of reflects this, this new way of working as well. So the job for life mentality that, that perhaps uh, my parents' generations had is ending. So that there's an increasing appetite to embrace flexible project styles of working. And this was emerging before the pandemic, um, I think, uh, COVID-19 has accelerated that trend. So um, more than someone coming within the hospitality and switching between hospitality and, and uh, maybe uh, social care, I'm thinking more of someone who, for example, wants to build their career as a so-called portfolio career. So rather than sticking to one company and progressing there throughout their life, they will be sort of switching from, from one company to the other and uh, building their experience that way. So I'm thinking within the, 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 the context of the university, if someone graduates with a, an engineering degree, so maybe they'll, they'll, they'll start working nine months at BMW, 12 months at uh, Volkswagen, six months somewhere else, and somewhere else and so on. So in addition to gaining new experience and improving their marketability, these sort of interim and contracting positions uh, give workers the, the flexibility to, the, to take holidays when they want, career breaks. Um, so importantly, they work to their own schedule. So flexibility is key there. Why is that more important than ever now? Well, as we said, there will be 
uh, high levels of unemployment for some time to come. Um, a lot of talent people looking for jobs. So there'll be an increase in, in competition out there in, in the market. So this year alone, we'll have about 400,000 students who would have graduated uh, this summer. Um, equally, we, we're going to be living with an increasingly uncertain economic landscape. Uh, which means that companies will need to add flexibility to their own workforce so that they can respond to fast changing market conditions and access the talent pool they need precisely when they need it. Uh, so from a business perspective, effectively, they're converting what's traditionally a fixed cost of an employee into a variable expense. So again, that gives them the flexibility in, in, in their cost base. So I would say for someone, whether, whether you're starting out, so whether you just graduating and you're just starting out or whether you're planning your next career move I would bear this in mind as either a, a route to market so by that I mean you start on on an interim basis on a flexible basis you prove yourself assuming you like the environment you like the job you may get permanent offer off the back of that or as a way of as I said enhancing your skills and and, and gaining more experience as, as you as you work through these different projects sure um, I mean, I, it's interesting as somebody who, you know, myself, I had a long term permanent job for 13 years right? and then developed a portfolio career. Um, and I've seen a lot of people do that. I'm also struck that it's quite a big shift in how you work and how you think about work and how you manage your time and so on. What do you think are the skills people need to become really kind of happy in a portfolio career and really valuable in, in a port with a portfolio career? I think you need to accept, you, you need to be open-minded um, and, and, and accept that there are positives uh, as, as well as some drawbacks to, to this sort of career. So as you said, you, you've, you've been in a, in a sort of permanent uh, contract uh, before where you're allowed to do things like going to, to the Christmas party, for example. Uh, you'll, you'll find most uh, flexible workers, as, as in contractors or, or, or temps, uh, perhaps not having the same, uh, Christmas parties is, is one example, but not the same sort of benefits and treated slightly differently, still, still within the rules, of course, uh, than permanent employees. So bear that in mind because, yes, you can take holiday whenever you want, but you don't have... The, the same uh, benefits that a permanent employee would have. So the holiday is effectively funded by yourself. You're not working, you're not earning, so you need to set aside something yourself. Um, similarly, uh, for things like uh, critical illness cover, uh, if you can't work, you don't have the same benefits as a permanent employee would have. So sick pay in this case. If you can't work as a, as a contractor, you're just not billing hours, you're not going to get paid. So yes, there's a, there's a high degree of flexibility and some people absolutely love it. They work six months, they'll, they'll earn loads of money because from, uh, I'm not gonna go into great details, but from a tax perspective, uh, there are certain advantages as um, uh, to, to working through a PSC, a, a personal service company, a limited company. Uh, so working for yourself. Although IR35, which is a piece of legislation that uh, um, was due to come in in April and has been postponed to next April, is trying to put a cap on onto these tax, tax advantages. But some of those people will work six months and then they'll just go and hold it for a month, uh, if they can afford it, that is. And then they'll come back knowing that their skills are in demand and they can have another stint doing whatever they want to do and then going off again and doing something else, doing some volunteering. So that flexibility is key for some people. They don't just want to be chained to a desk working, you know, the stereotypical nine to five. Um, they, they, they have bigger, better plans perhaps, and they want to execute them as they wish. Sure. And I think, you know, what's interesting about that is, as you, as you say, you know, you need quite a lot of financial savvy to think ahead in terms of how you protect yourself to give yourself financial stability if you don't have employment stability. Um, but I think, you know, what, what the people who do it, who like it, always say to me is I've never worked so hard in my life and I've never felt I had so much freedom. And so it is this kind of paradox that on the one hand you feel <clears throat> it's very uh, volatile in terms of what's available. But on the other hand, your career is yours. It's not being dictated 
by a big institution that knows what it wants from you and may not be as concerned with what you want from it. Absolutely. Thanks, Vincenzo. I'd like to move on now to um, talk to Ariana Gadd. Um, in our last webinar, we heard from Ian and Dan, who were the, fit, who were the founders of Fit TV, an online provider of exercise programs, which I can vouch for myself, I have to say, in lockdown. Um, I wish I did it more often, but then it nags me to do it more often, so who knows one day. Anyway, Fit TV has continued to hire all the way through the pandemic, which I think is really pretty cool and says a lot for their tenacity and focus. But I can imagine it's quite difficult for those people who are just starting. One of the people who just started at Fit TV is Ariane, who's the lead DevOps engineer there. Now, Ariane, I know you haven't been at Fit TV very long. Could you just tell us a little bit about how you got there through the course of the pandemic? Sure. Hi. Um, thanks very much for, for having me on. Um, so yes, I started at Fit about two months ago now, end of April. So right bang in the middle of the sort of pandemic, everyone was in lockdown um, and sort of near the beginning. So um, literally people sort of weren't leaving their homes and it was all very new to everyone. Um, I actually, um, interviewed at FIT uh, in January. So got to meet some of the uh, team in the office. I got to uh, kind of do a group workout with them and things like that. So then I was very excited about joining, but uh, naturally not expecting to join in the situation that I did. Uh, so, but I mean, the, because of the, re the, the fact that they were still hiring and the, the situation had actually caused quite a surge in growth of the, of the, of the app, um, and, the, and the user base that uh, they were sort of thinking about this already, kind of thinking about how um, how to bring on the onboarding, being a bit more creative about onboarding virtually. So, uh, from my experience, I, you know, they um, made sure I got to meet all different people from around the company, so that those sort of conversations that you'd um, you'd have just walking around the office or going up to somebody's desk. They kind of tried to recreate that by having various calls, sort of virtual lunches um, and, and doing a lot to kind of make sure that the onboarding process was as smooth. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously been strange uh, and completely unexpected, but um, you know, the, the things that they've done to be creative and to try and make um, the experience, the working from home experience as collaborative as possible has been, has been really good. Uh, and, and the, and it, and it was definitely um, a, a lot more, um, a lot, a lot better, better onboarding and, and sort of smooth transition into the role than, than I expected when I initially realized I would be starting during, during the pandemic. Yeah, I can imagine that must have been pretty daunting. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm very interested in this sense in which careers now are significantly self-designed and self-motivated rather than kind of um, planned out by big institutions. So I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about why you made the decision to jump from a pretty established conventional business to a brand new startup and, you know, what that says about your, your appetite for risk or the way that you're thinking about your career. Yeah, so, well, when I, when I saw the job um, with Fit, I, um, I, I knew about the app anyway. It's very interested. It's something that I'm personally interested in as well. Um, so I thought I'll sort of have a chat and see, see what, what they're looking for uh, and what they're trying to achieve with, with looking for a DevOps engineer because they hadn't actually had a, had a DevOps engineer before. <laughs> um, what was quite exciting to me is to come in and sort of shape the future of the, the sort of DevOps side of the app. Of the app. Um, and I think that's, so that's quite exciting and it's quite challenging and something that you're not going to get with a more larger and sort of more uh, mature organization. Um, and with, you know, the sort of flexibility to make my own decisions and drive how I wanted it to go, that was sort of really interesting to me. Yeah. Um, yes, it was, it, you know, it's, it's quite a scary move because um, going from uh, having sort of very established um, sort of set up and um, kind of organization like clients and backing and stuff that, that going to a role where I would be kind of open to making my own decisions and um, driving the direction of where we want to go um, but I felt like I was ready for the sort of the next challenge and also wanted to get more get back to more more 
in in depth technical role as well um because you know technology is changing every day and this is working with something very innovative and new new tools all the time so i also you know wanted to continue my learning and i felt like making the move to somewhere where i was definitely going to be able to kind of explore the technology the technology space was was yeah what i wanted to do next yeah it's really interesting i remember one of the best employees employees i ever had had um you know would spend a couple of years in a sort of large corporation where she'd learn a lot about process and scale and then she'd go and work for a startup where she had a lot more freedom and creative input and she kind of bounced between those two and you know she ended up with a resume that said actually this is somebody who could work anywhere you know because she had fabulous sense of process and scale and fabulous amounts of kind of creative initiative and it was an absolutely stunning combo. Yeah. Just, just thinking about when you, you know, when you started at uh, Fit, what were the kind of tricky things about finding your way around, given you weren't in an office, and kind of getting to meet people? And what sort of tips would you give anybody who's starting in that situation? Because some people being hired now won't even ever have seen the, the, the office or have met the people who are now their colleagues. What do you think, how should they approach that? Yeah, so it is it is very strange because, you know, you're very used to being able to go up to somebody's desk and ask questions, particularly starting in a new role. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to get access to and to figure out sort of just the general processes that you follow. So I think, uh, yeah, it is, it is strange and you've got to kind of be a little bit creative and innovative, look at different technologies that you can use in order to kind of uh, make it a little bit easier for yourself. So I think um making sure that you have frequent sort of channels of communication with your colleagues so it's easy to imagine that you're sort of sat next to them and you'd look over at their computer so sort of instant messaging type thing um and and making sure that you've got sort of regular catch-ups with particular people that you work with regularly but also with people that you don't work with regularly that you that would uh sort of you, you wouldn't normally meet if you were not in the office so making sure you sort of interact with those as well so you get a wider view of the company because so i think you know it's really important that whilst i'm in the technology role that i understand everything else that's going on the marketing the um the, the uh, social media side of it and all, all of that so i think you know you've got to be a little bit proactive reach out to people and um make sure you're using sort of the technology channels that you've got whether it's staying on a call after a meeting and having a chat with people informally so it's not sort of that formal meetings finished and and moving on um you know perhaps um setting up things in the evenings where you can get to know each other or a virtual lunch and things like that i think there's there's, there's the social element of working with your colleagues that you're missing from um starting a job um uh, remotely and the other thing is there's a lot of sort of fitness group fitness that was pre that we were previously um would be doing together so i think we still kind of make sure that we do that and we join fit club we can see each other on the leaderboard um so so doing things like that is is kind of bringing that sort of team feel back to um working from home situation so yeah fascinating and um at this point do you have any sense of when you might be able to go back into the office i think the, we're saying around September time, but that that we never know that could change, and that will definitely not be sort of everyone going back at once. It will sort of be in in bits. Um, I think I, we're hoping to potentially, especially for the um, technology team who we we work in kind of quite collaboratively, whiteboarding sessions, things like that. We might hope to kind of maybe do some. Um, outside sort of meetings eventually where we can uh, bounce ideas off each other and it's a little bit more personal being with each other. Um, but there's, yeah, there's, there's, we won't be going back in any sort of force yeah, before September. Brilliant, thanks so much. Um, I'd like to move on now to talk to Miranda Kamis. Miranda is the co-founder and chief operating officer of Food Drop. When Miranda graduated, she didn't go looking for a job. She went looking for finance to set up her own business along with her co-founder, Everest Ikong. Miranda, being an entrepreneur is a very cunning way to get a job, right? Which is you create your own job. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what Food Drop, food drop is and how you got it started? 
Sure. Um, thank you so much for having me on. So Food Drop is a tech platform that connects unsold food to different local charities. At the time when we were at university, there was a lot being done around food waste. And we saw so many fantastic initiatives kind of being set up to, to connect large amounts of produce and stock to different charities. However, on the high street, there was nothing really easily available or any infrastructure to make it easy for when there was food left at the end of the day for that to go to a good cause. Looking at as well kind of the changes that were happening in the industry, we saw that in the future there was going to be a lot more importance of kind of reporting on this and being able to be transparent on exactly where produce goes. So we set up Food Drop, which is a tech platform. We work with three leading high street um, chains to enable their stores to distribute food to local charities. We monitor the food, um, well, the levels of food in the store, and then we match this to different local charities who use an AI powered chatbot. Mm -hmm. And the bot works on WhatsApp and helps to coordinate their collections. And they can also access information like parking, um, different directions, and also group collections from different stores. Over lockdown, we worked with McDonald's and we created a bespoke platform for them to help redistribute food from restaurants all across the UK to different local charities. Um, and we also did some work to help them at the distribution level as well. So that's kind of where it, what we do. Um, where it started from is it actually started as a passion project between me and my co-founder when we were at Bath in I think it was our third year and we set up a kind of small project student run project connecting food where well, it was connecting charities volunteers and different stores um, and then we were very fortunate enough and we won some kind of different university entrepreneurial competitions and released our first mobile app from that we kind of gathered a lot of data a lot of feedback and we're like this was a great experience, but there's about a hundred different things we would do differently. Um, so we put together our plan and whilst we were completing our masters, we started to kind of venture into London, speak with different retailers and said, Hey, if we put this platform together, would you be involved? And would you, would you support us? Um, we had lots of kind of conversations and yeah, we moved to London as soon as we graduated the first eight to nine months were really difficult. Um, we were very fortunate. We raised our seed round. And then in August 2019, uh, we launched in the east of London with um, three different partners. And then we grew nationally. So just before lockdown, we launched um, in Liverpool. Um, we had Brighton, Manchester and Cambridge coming up. And then with McDonald's, we scaled nationally very quickly. Um, so it's been a kind of crazy journey, but it's been really exciting and kind of um, being able to grow something from almost like the seed um, right out into kind of what you envision, really. Fantastic. Fantastic. I mean, entrepreneurship is famously risky. Um, do you think you have a high tolerance for risk? You know, what has kind of given you the nerve and the con confidence to just forge ahead I think on the flip side it's also like if things were to go wrong what's the the worst that can happen or what position are you in mm -hmm. I felt even now at the time it's even if the worst thing goes wrong and it doesn't work out there are skills that I've kind of acquired there's definitely a network I've been able to grow and mm -hmm. all of that stuff really is what's going to still elevate you to your next step and I think if there's, for me, if there's ever a time to start something, it's when you have less responsibilities. So leaving university, I didn't have, let's say a family or a mortgage or the things that really kind of, I think, prevent people from being more risk taking. So it was almost more so a why not than, than why not, <laughs> yeah, than looking at the more negative side of things. Yeah, absolutely. Any, um, have there been any particular difficulties because of working through the pandemic? I definitely think so. There's been challenges for us. As I kind of said, the vision for us was always to create this platform that worked throughout the high street. So if we're not doing food, we wanted to move into kind of clothes and looking at other kind of toiletry products, how we could create this one uniform platform. 
Um, and obviously there's the challenges now because the high street <laughs> was shut and a lot of our clients and potential clients are going through a really difficult period. Um, on the flip side of that, I think there's far greater awareness now of needing to build the infrastructure to kind of support communities, um, look about how we're doing that in a responsible manner. So it's almost like as much as, much as there is that kind of negative side of this is a really difficult time there's also it's kind of shone the light on the importance of using tech i think in particular to kind of solve some of the societal challenges we're faced with yeah wonderful wonderful thank you miranda and sancha um sancha is placements manager for the school of management and chair of the university's employability forum so she's been in touch with companies offering placements to students right through the crisis. Sancha, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you um, for having me. I'm assuming there have been a lot of changes during this period. And I just wonder um, what has really struck you most in terms of how the job market, placement market, intern internship market has shifted. Um, yeah, well, thank you, as I said, Margaret, for, for having me this morning. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting time, I think it's, it's fair to say. Uh, I think where we are now, um, there has been a pause on the placement recruitment market, um, but I don't think there's been a complete stop. So we're feeling optimistic and positive about uh, what will come through the summer and into the autumn. Already Europe is uh, sort of setting the scene for offices opening up and, and, and recruitment beginning to build again. And, and hopefully you know, the UK will follow suit in the same way. Um, I think what struck me the most has been for us the commitment from our placement providers at, uh, at Bath for the companies that want to continue to work with our students. Um, a good indication of that was actually um, the very few numbers of students that we had uh, going on to furlough when the pandemic struck. So those students who were still on placement were kept on and for us that was a fantastic sign that not all was lost. Uh, going forward, we're beginning to see things beginning to creep up again in momentum, which is which is really uh, exciting for us. Um, but but really, it's the resilience of, of the placement providers. It's the resilience of the employers um, to keep in touch with us, to keep the communication flowing between us, the student um, and themselves as the recruiter to say it's a pause. It's not a complete stop. Of course, that's not the same across every organisation and there are some sectors, as Vincenzo um, uh, alluded to, there's some sectors that are going to be uh, more highly affected than others. Uh, so it, it's just for all of us keeping an open mind, both from the employers, but also from those who are looking for seeking jobs as well. Sure, sure. You and I had a conversation a while back about people being work ready. I wonder if you could describe what you think being work ready is. Um, very good question. It, it, it's our responsibility at, at the university um, to, to make sure that our students finish their education with us, uh, both uh, with a rigorous academic knowledge, but also that they have had a rigorous education through the character and skills and traits that are going to make them good employees of the future. Uh, so being work ready, and we've all talked about it already, is about not only having the skills that can be transferable into the workplace, but having an understanding of them, having the emotional intelligence to be able to translate those into a practical work environment, and then importantly, being able to demonstrate those skills, whether that be at an interview, whether it be within an internship or a placement, or actually that first week of work when you're, you're cementing your, your, your feet in the grounding of the position. Right, right. Um, how useful or misguided do you think it would be in this situation to work for free? This is an, an interesting debate because this is a debate that, that we always have within placements. Um, within the School of Management, we typically haven't had unpaid placement and we don't 
historically look to promote unpaid placement. Mm. And that's predominantly because a there's enough opportunities out there. There have always been enough opportunities out there which are paid. Secondly, it's we're very mindful that that all students, no matter what their financial personal financial position, um, have the same opportunities to be able to apply and work for the same jobs as everybody else. And obviously, if there's unpaid placements, um, that may well uh, price some students out of that opportunity. Having said that, there are other parts of the university where unpaid placements are a, a little bit more normal. Um, uh, over in um, humanities, social sciences, um, that, that sort of arena. These are different times. Uh, and the debate that we have within within the School of Management is if there are students that don't have the skills and need to acquire those skills in a really tough market, should we still allow them the opportunity to go for placements if they feel that they can financially commit to an unpaid placement? Um, and of course, what we have to look at is that we want the, we want the students to all have the opportunity to build skills. So we're having to go into this with a, with a different perspective and, and a different open-minded approach, but wherever we can, and at all terms of the way, we are encouraging our placement providers, our employers, that these are young professionals. These are young professionals with skills that are going to really contribute and add value to their business. Um, mm. And therefore, there should be financial compensation for the work that they're doing. So at least we're asking around minimum wage. We're asking about if it's a situation where it's unpaid initially with expenses only while they're working from home. If that situation should change and the offices open up, then the, there would need to be a review particularly if an individual is going to have to move and take on financial costs. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm just thinking of someone who works for me currently who um, at one point moved to Singapore and couldn't find a job and ended up saying uh, to a law firm, I will work for you for a month for free and then you have to tell me whether you want to employ, employ me. And that's how she got her job, you know, and she had a kind of enough confidence and I guess enough financial breathing space that she could do that but it's it's tricky because it's very hard not to resent the fact that everybody around you is being paid and you're not but on the other hand if something comes out of it perhaps it's worth it um just one last question before we kind of open it up to the questions that we're getting and i should say through the q a box not the chat box but we will get to those questions shortly um, I, I mean, as somebody who has hired hundreds, if not thousands of people, I'm always very interested in how people deal with stress and crises. And it seems to me that one of the questions that will loom large in the future will be, what did you do during the pandemic? And it also strikes me that the people who say, oh, I watched a lot of Netflix are not going to have a great outcome. <laughs> In this environment where perhaps many, many, many people will find it impossible to find paid work, what, they, what can they do to, be, to look attractive, practical, useful to a potential employee? One of the things that, that the pandemic has brought us, and I'm sure we've all experienced this um, in, in our working lives, is how much stuff has now gone online. And there are now such a huge wealth of opportunities that are accessible for so many more people that weren't there previously. So for those that haven't got employment at the moment, it's to embrace the opportunities that the pandemic has brought us to go and do online networking, to attend online webinars, listen in on webinars such as this, this is a prime example, um, to, to, to get involved with online sort of skills development. There've been a, a number of platforms that have opened up their courses at either reduced rates or some of them even free. Um, so, so all of these are things that anybody can be doing if they found themselves in a lull of employment. Because when employers of the future do say, what did you do to, uh, through the pandemic? Those of course are some of the things that, that you can fall back on. 
equally we're all we always have done but we even more so now we we encourage our students to think about how they can continue to develop their transferable traits and skills from other things in life and that could well be um, uh, volunteering community engagement setting up their own small business at home whatever that might be um, to uh, to um, to, to getting involved with those online courses and skills development, but also keeping up with things like their sporting um, uh, interests as well. Uh, one of the, the best conversations I, I had with, with a student relatively recently was, was a student that was able to articulate the learning and the skills that they had developed out of taking part in the Couch to 5K app so simple and yet so much was able to come out of that small activity that they had gone through so those are the sort of things is just to keep busy uh, and there are lots of things we can all be doing to keep busy and then thinking about what was involved with that activity and how that can be articulated into a transferable skill yeah interesting i mean one of the best entrepreneurs i have ever known or written about um, spent years working um, as a volunteer and managing volunteers. And her view was actually, if you can manage volunteers who can walk out the door at any moment, you can manage anybody. <laughs> you know? So yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic space in which to learn. Right, I want to turn now to some of the questions that we're getting from our audience. And uh, we've had a question about pay. Now, in, according to the Financial Times, in the UK, 28% of job offers have been rescinded or delayed. In the US, 4% of employers have withdrawn internship offers, 20% are considering it, 21% of employers have stopped offering them, and 12% of employers say that they're reducing pay. I wonder, Vincenzo, if you can help us out here. Do you see much in, the ter in terms of wages going down? That's a very good question and uh, I just want to add a, a very very small quote from, from Churchill who famously said, this is regarding the previous point, never let a good crisis go to waste. So regardless of the state of the economy there are always opportunities out there. Make sure you're in the best position to, to capitalize on those. Um, on to the wage inflation. I mean wage inflation has been subdued for a number of years. It was only recently that we've seen real wages, so keeping up with inflation, uh, as, as measured by the, the CPI. So um, I, 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 don't, I, I see a lot of pressure, downward pressure on, on, on wages. Uh, at the moment, uh, we just before the pandemic, we were looking at circa two to 3% wage inflation, um, which by historic standards is, is minimal. Um, just before that, uh, it was either pretty much 2% or nothing, uh, because 1% is sort of, it's just insulting, really. You might as well keep it, don't do anything, and keep it for next year and do 2% next year. Um, there, are, there are various aspects of how this is going to pan out in the months to come. So you mentioned uh, a lot of job offers have, have either been put on hold or withdrawn completely. Why could that be the case? Well, don't forget that employers have already a, uh, a, a workforce, some of which may have been put on furlough. So the first point of call for the employer is to go and pick those people who already have the skills, have the knowledge of the company and have been around and put them back into the company. So before they go out to the market and hire fresh new talent, they will always most likely go back to that talent pool they already have and is part there in hibernation and unlock that. So what what that that does for 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 wage inflations they'll be subdued for for some time to come uh and and, and this will go uh, along with um, interest rates uh um for for, for years to come I, I i suppose there are not that many catalysts for change in in the short term that is there will always be pockets of higher wage inflation for those skills that are more in demand uh and, and we've covered some, some of those um, we could potentially see, depending on uh, unions and, and government action, uh, a bit of wage inflation uh, across the public sector, which historically has had a number of pay freezes. So if you think of uh, the, the health sector, the, the, the NHS, 
well, we all think that they've done a great job and we're all thankful. Um, what they, they also should be uh, recognized for is uh, in, 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 in a monetary way, you know, to, 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 to give them a little contribution for, for, the, for the whole the hard work that, uh, that they've done. Um, so yes, a little bit of wage inflation in, in the public sector, not much in the private sector because every company will be heavily focusing on cost control. Uh, if they want new people, they'll draw on the talent pool that's been furloughed and they'll just, they'll just be um, hoarding cash for the short term, uh, repairing their balance sheet and making sure that if there is a second wave, they are well protected and, and, and they, can, uh, they can survive that second wave. Sure. Um, we've had another question about how valuable in this kind of job market is having a degree. And I wonder if I'd like to come back to you, Vicenza, but I wonder, first of all, Ariane, in terms of your career and also some of the people you're working alongside, um, how far is education a crucial part of, of um, job hunting in your sector? It's a very good question, actually, because um, I have sort of maybe a mi mixed answer to that. So I uh, got my initial job in technology with, at KPMG. Um, because I had a, had, a, had a degree and I got onto the graduate scheme. Um, but when I started there, uh, I, I took on a completely different role. As a DevOps engineer, I did my degree in economics um, and nothing from my degree helped me. Um, I took a master's in computer science whilst I was doing the graduate scheme. So that's where I picked up the um, sort of the, the technology sort of theory skills. Um, but definitely the on the job training and the industry specific learning was what really benefited me in my career doing um, certifications on technologies that you're working with and, and purely on the job training. I would say um, specifically in the technology sector, it's always changing. So it's impossible for you to have a degree which is gonna cover every, absolutely everything or all the modern things that are continually developing. I learn new things every day. Um, it's absolutely impossible to say that everyone, that you know everything about one thing. Um, so yes, if you wanted to get into a big corporation, uh, the degree helps you to get onto the graduate schemes and it helps you with, um, yeah, sort of that, that sort of aspect of things. But I would definitely say that if you want to start a career and especially in technology, going out and, and learning on, on, um, sort of the online platforms or, um, webinars that are going on is, is really beneficial and, and actually getting your hands on and, and doing some, doing work. And I, I've definitely worked with people that have come from either a degree that's nothing to do with the industry they're in or don't have a degree at all. And I don't think it, it really makes a difference. What makes a difference is that drive to learn, the passion to learn and doing sort of relevant technology or relevant, um, sort of learning to, to, to your job. Yeah, attitude and aptitude. Yeah. Uh, Miranda, um, in terms of thinking of the kinds of people you might want to hire, what do you think you will be looking for? Kind of similarly to Ariana, I do think it's a mixture that you obviously want to understand that they have the relevant experience needed. But I think there's something about someone showing tenacity that in maybe their own time or spare time, they are very aware um, and have kind of done relevant, their own kind of independent research into that specific area. I think also an awareness of the current problems that they'll be tackling and solving is so important. Um, over the kind of past year, we have interviewed or kind of discussed with people and what's really great and what's always stood out is when people are able to really identify um, the different issues that you may be facing and how they can help to solve that. But as kind of Ariane said, that really does come with experience, which can be difficult um, to kind of get at the same time. So really is a mixture. And I don't think we would discount or not look at someone just purely because of their academic track record, if they can show that there is that kind of personal independent study into the specific area, even especially with tech, like we have spoken to people from places like Flatiron School um, and other kind of areas and institutions, however, it really is kind of specific to the candidate, I'd say. Yeah, interesting, thank you. Vicenza, I wonder if we could come back to you. So we're having a lot of questions about the kind of balance between um, kind of attitude and aptitude and um, kind of uh, academic skills. And where do you see the balance between those two things? 
Cool. I mean, Ariane and Miranda are absolutely spot on. Um, I'd say, you know, the market doesn't owe you a job just because you have a degree from a good university. Um, now, I, th I think we should uh, we should all be open um, for for opportunities that we might not have planned for. So, if someone has tried a, a graduate scheme and that didn't work, you know, I wouldn't discount looking for an entry level job to get a foot in the door in that organisation and then work hard to prove yourself and, and, and further your, your career that way. Um, I'm a, actually a great fan and a great believer of apprenticeships as well. Um, I'm, I'm a chartered accountant. Um, I've, I, I do have a degree and, 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 and I've studied my articles, but uh, there are routes into uh, chartered accountancy now that do not uh, require a, uh, a degree. So uh, you'll see some of, the, some of the big four accounting firms of uh, apprenticeships um, and those are really competing with top universities uh, because they, they, they can attract uh, some, some school leavers, they can promise them um, a fast track career, not only will they be learning, they'll be earning on the job as well and they'll come out with um, uh, the equivalent pretty much of a degree, probably quicker and more importantly cheaper than, than, than a university. Um, so I think universities have, all universities, this, this is, they really have their work cut out to, to compete now with these apprenticeship schemes. Having said that, I think having a degree will open doors. And, and what I mean by that is um, certainly when, when, when I was applying for jobs, when um, so everything was computerized to, to start the, the, the first screening, um, you know, you couldn't even start without UCAS points, you have a degree and, and so on. So it, it was a pretty much a computer says no, you're automatically out. Now I think that they're a bit more um, uh, accepting of different paths to, 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 to get into a job. But certainly there are, there are a number of jobs that, that do require a degree to, to, to start off. So it, it's, it's a difficult one. Uh, both Ariane and, and, and Moran that have, have, uh, have uh, evaluated you know, the, the pros and cons. I still think it's worth it. I still think it not only does it uh, does it make you more rounded in, in the vision. It's not just that the, the learning is you know as, as uh, Sancho was saying, it's how, how you turn those into practical and relevant skills that an employer uh, can appreciate. Um, so yes, by all means, get a degree, but make sure that you get something out of it. I've had, I've interviewed some people for finance schemes, this is, uh, where I've asked about uh, financial statements and the answer was, well, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a people person. <laughs> so I, th I think you need to be incredibly savvy uh, about the fact that, yes, you do have a degree, it, it will open doors, mm. but you still need to compete with people coming from different backgrounds, perhaps an apprenticeships uh, background, which may have uh, very similar, if not, uh, uh, you know, higher skills than an equivalent degree would have equipped you with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. And Sancha, thinking both of placements, but also about employability. Um, where, I mean, obviously, it seems to me pretty obvious as somebody who's hired people, you know, for a long time, that you want people who have the requisite specific skills for a job. And you also want personal characteristics in terms of being able to work with other people and being able to make a contribution. Where do you see the balance between these two things lying? Um, so with, with, with all our undergraduate courses uh, within the School of Management, uh, a placement is either a mandatory embedded uh, part of the study um, or it, it's always an option. Um, as part of the study. And so keeping that balance, and, and it's something that historically we at Bath have always championed, keeping that balance between the academic and the theoretical studies and gaining and applying those studies in a practical environment is what then ensures that we have students graduating with the right balance. Um, on top of that, it's not just about going out and getting that practical experience in, in the placement. It's about the opportunities that are happening on campus within their university life as well. So encouraging our students to be involved with volunteering, to be involved with sports, 
We run um, a, a, a compulsory professional development programme for all students, whether they'll be going on placement or not from their first year. And this is to ensure that we're building employability skills right from the very beginning. So from the minute they enter university in their first week in the School of Management, um, uh, all our students uh, on the undergraduate courses take, take part in, um, in, in a big challenge, a business challenge. So right from the very beginning, we're saying having the balance between your studies and how you're going to apply those studies in the working world is really important. And so it's great when we, we see students then exiting uh, as graduates and, and going into reams of different opportunities from entrepreneurs and setting up their own businesses through to entering the sort of the big four graduate uh, schemes and programs. Um, and for us, that's a reflection that by embedding these employability um, studies right from the very beginning and encouraging our students to go out to explore, to be creative, uh, to be innovative, to, to build all these super uh, important communication skills and, and other, uh, other transferable skills is important from the very beginning. Mm. Well, I said you make a really interesting point, which is that the university experience is not just, as it were, old fashioned book learning. It's also about the opportunity to learn how to work with other people and to get involved in projects and so on. Um, we've had a question from Steve, which is, um, how far do you think within the university curriculum, um, the balance of practical skills versus, as it were, more kind of theoretical stuff, do you see that changing at all? Do you think that, you know, that, that universities need to kind of tweak the curriculum to make people more employable, or is it a balance between the, the kind of academic stuff and the campus stuff? Um, it, it, it's very difficult for, for, for me to say um, because obviously I can't necessarily speak from the academic um, uh, point of view, but, but, but any service provider um, is continually having to adapt and adjust to the world that's happening around them and, and university is no different and, and Vincenzo brings up a really good point about obviously um, the element of, of apprenticeships that, that come in so it's really important that we as, as a university and all universities are, are continually monitoring what we're doing um, and benchmarking what our students are exiting with in terms of employability uh, skills and employability success by what we're offering them within their undergraduate studies and by embedding it from the very beginning and saying to students from the, that first week we see this is important we're here to support and encourage you no matter what your 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 journey or your plans are going to be um, it, it, it's making sure that that's happening from the very beginning to to, to make sure that they 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 go out and can find their, their best exit routes yeah, thank you. We've had a really interesting question here um, from someone who prefers to remain anonymous, which is, do you believe that working from home can gradually transform to working from anywhere? And how might that affect pay? And I, I mean, I'm interested because, you know, speaking personally, I work for companies all over the world. And, you know, the great thing for me about the pandemic has been that I can do it from home. And I just wonder if, as more and more companies become more accustomed to remote working, will that mean that the job market has hugely expanded geographically? Vicenzo, I wonder if you could speak to that initially, please. That uh, uh, is incredibly relevant at the moment and, uh, and it will be. Uh, I think it, it was a trend that, again, it was there in the background before the pandemic. It has just been accelerated a thousand times now. Uh, I'd say there are probably some uh, um, some some tax implications of working um, from a different territory. So uh, I'd absolutely love to to to, to go back to, to Italy and uh, and and work from uh, from uh, my parents' home. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'll be taxed through the roof if I, if I were to do that, both from Italy and, and, and from the UK. Um, so if it's done. For uh, as as a, as a temporary uh, in, in a temporary way, yes, that works and, and it's fine. It obviously, it's, it's at the discretion of your employer. But a lot of employers are now uh, opening up to the concept of uh, it worked during the pandemic. We made it work, 
uh, why could we not carry on this way? Um, and, and there are some fundamental questions that, uh, that, that we are ourselves we're asking. Uh, what's our footprint? What's our office footprint going to be looking like in the future? Do we need all these offices for, for all these people? Or are we looking at pretty much hot desking? So cutting down the number of offices, hot desking, knowing that a few people will, will be working remotely. Uh, this inevitably means that uh, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a trend for, for mainly for freelance work where uh, from anywhere in the world there are platforms basically where you basically uh, put what you need, put your requirement on the, on the platform and people will bid for that work, whether it's development or something. Um, it tends to be in the IT space mostly. Mm. So someone from San Francisco says, I don't want to hire very expensive uh, um, IT developer here, I'll post this job on freelance, um, in this freelance pl platform, and chances are that uh, someone, some very high skilled engineer uh, in the Philippines and in India or wherever will do that at a fraction of the cost. So this is already happening. The competition for, for these jobs is going to be incredibly immense now because um, effectively the, the database of, of, of workers has been democratized yeah you, the, the internet has, has, has allowed that, that, yeah. that and the pandemic has accelerated this trend so the employers now know they can draw from different sources everywhere in the world yeah and in general where that has really taken off has led to wages absolutely plummeting correct I and mean, i think it's also worth pointing out that you know if i think of the large range of companies I work, in, work with in different co companies and different countries, um, I don't see anybody who wants to work from home forever. Uh, you know, absolutely nobody. You know, they miss the congeniality, they miss the sociability. And there's a lot about working from home that can become really clunky, that simple things that over 30 second conversation, you know, become 57 emails instead. So I think you know, I think as Vincenzo says, I think that it, how much we do work from home is, is really a kind of unknown factor. But I'd just like to ask quickly, Ariane and then Miranda, you know, when you think about your careers, how would you feel about working from home for a company in, I don't know, Singapore? So, um, yeah, um, I... What I would say, particularly starting with Fit, which is sort of a very a growing company, really exciting to work for. Everyone's kind of really passionate about the product and there's a lot of opportunity for it. I would say, I, you know, there's sort of a team feel to, to it as well. And they've really tried to bring that to the sort of working from home situation, but it still is missing the element of us getting together and um, looking at ideas, going into the studio, doing great workouts, things like that. So I think for me, um, I, I really, you know, I, I, I don't mind working from home at all. I've got quite a nice office set up and, and things. Uh, and I like the flexibility of, um, sort of not commuting, but um, I definitely don't think I could work from home constantly. And I think I do really do miss that sort of collaboration that you get when you're in the office, especially in a tech team where you're doing sort of really agile kind of things and you, and you just want to sort of chat to somebody o o across the desk or, or get together in a more sort of post-it note type or whiteboarding type situation. So for me, I think, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I don't want it to be, to be, I don't want to be working from home constantly. And I think, especially if it was in a different time zone as well, whilst it's possible and definitely doable in my industry, because it's all online. Uh, so long as you've got a good internet connection, it's totally doable. I think there's still the element of getting together, particularly working for a startup where everyone's really passionate and driven about the product. You want to get together and celebrate the successes. And yeah, so I think, yeah, for me, uh, I'm still looking forward to get back to the office. Yeah, it's interesting. I was talking to a, a chap last night to, to, about some work that we're doing together and he was in the Philippines and it was midnight for him. And I just thought, oh my, you know, this is horrible, horrible. Yeah. Um, Miranda, if you, would you consider for, um, for your company, would you think of hiring somebody who was say based in Singapore or in, I don't know, Sweden because they had the right skills? I think it really does depend. So on a more practical side, when we created the bespoke platform for McDonald's, that was when lockdown had occurred. So we did that remotely as a team and it worked really well. We, as kind of Ariane said, there's plenty of different messaging features um, to allow for collaborative working. Um, 
and being able to call each other and kind of really build in that team kind of relationship. I remember when we, when the platform first went launch, we were all on a video call together um, and you can have that kind of bonding. But I think on the flip side, the concern I would have would be that, especially as a small startup where you don't have the developed infrastructure as a company, to what extent are you able to support your employees? Because you don't have a, a developed HR de department that's checking on their well-being, ensuring how they're feeling against the matching their goals and personal development, all, and all these different features, which, because I think we are used to working in an office and next to each other, we're a lot more easier to do. And it kind of, I've seen over lockdown, even myself, I've introduced different initiatives, but stuck at them for two, three weeks. And then thought of another one I've seen and think like, let's try that as a team. And I don't think that's probably the best approach. It's a learning experience. So more so on the management side, that would be my main risk with employing people abroad and not having that face-to-face -face communication. To what extent am I able to manage that efficiently? Right, thank you. And I've got a question here uh, for Sancha from Michelle. Um, you know, some graduates are obviously going to, well, all graduates, I think, are going to find a pretty tough job market. And some out of pure financial necessity may be um, thinking about taking jobs very much below what they feel themselves to be qualified for. So whether they're going to work for a supermarket, say, or as Vincenzo was saying, perhaps work in a care home, which is not their ultimate goal, but it's what's available right now. Um, how would you how would you advise them? Do you think this is going to be helpful or is it going to send the wrong sig kinds of signals? Um, really something that, that, that we learned back in 2008 was that graduates, graduates back in 2008 ended up going into a, a kind of a, a series of, of fear fear of rejection, fear of there's going to be too many people going for this job, fear of I've made too many applications and I keep getting rejected. So first of all, it's, it's not to have that fear um, and it's to still look at the opportunities that are going to be available and make sure that, that you're still tailoring your applications for those positions. So not to do yourself a, a disservice because we are our own worst critics and we are, as humans, very, very uh, good at talking ourselves out of things. Um, so that would be, be the, first, the, the first kind of tip there. Secondly, it's important in this current market to have a plan B, a plan C and maybe even a plan D. Um, and if you can't go straight from here to plan A, to go to plan B or plan C as a, as a reroute to get you back to plan A. Um, so again, it's going into that with, with an open mind and, and just accepting that that might be the scenario, but to keep that plan A in mind and not to let it go. And to think this is just, this is just a bit of a diversion around to get to plan A. But if you're going or finding yourself taking a position which you would consider is, is not meeting your professional expectations, to really look at what you can be getting out of it, to think, as, as, as Margaret said there, to think about one of the hardest things is, is to manage volunteers. And I've, I've done that um, in my past, and it is extremely difficult because volunteers can drop out at the last minute. Um, uh, so, so taking just the job apart and looking at it piece by piece and thinking what am I really getting out of this and how am I then going to be able to as I've said before articulate this into my plan a when it does come around because it will come around and you just have to stay optimistic about it right I'm going to ask one very quick question and then we're going to start wrapping up because sadly we're out of time although we have a ton of absolutely brilliant brilliant questions um, this Vincenzo, the question is really for you. Are you seeing much in the way of age discrimination? You know, there are people of all ages. We've been looking specifically at, at graduates and people at the beginning of their careers, but the truth is that this upheaval is going to apply to anybody in work where, you know, all sectors are undergoing upheaval. Do you see anything in the way of age discrimination? It's going to be a very short answer, and, and the answer is, no, um, and I'll elaborate a little bit more on that. We 
um, we're lucky that um, we don't have to state um, date of birth or any, any sort of specific sort of gender when, when we apply for jobs. Um, and although there's, there's always um, an element of unconscious bias when it comes to interviewing someone, and, and that's, there's, a, there's an awful lot of literature, which uh, yeah, we, we haven't got time for now, but uh, is there. It's, it's, uh, it, it's really difficult to, to, to uh, eliminate. Um, I don't see any particular cases of age discrimination. Um, as long as you, so if, if you perhaps come further down the line uh, to, to apply for a job, uh, I myself didn't start university until I was 21. I was called a mature student. Um, hey, <laughs> uh, so, yeah. uh, I, I, I think as long as you can explain uh, whether you, you have gaps in your CV, for example, what have you done uh, with that time? How, how useful was it? What have you learned from it? Uh, I, I generally don't think um, there's any evidence of it, at least. That's really encouraging. Okay, I'd like to, to um, end by asking each of you one question, which is, could you just give one recommendation to help job hunters keep calm, carrying on during this prolonged period of uncertainty? Ariane, I wonder if we could come to you first, please. Sure, I would say, Definitely don't be afraid to, if you're looking to sort of move jobs and things, it's, uh, you know, don't, don't be afraid to do that just because we're in this situation. Everyone is in it, all employers and all job, job seekers. I would say be creative with what you're, with what you're looking for. Not, maybe not necessarily the perfect role is, is available to you. So be creative, look at online courses you can do and different areas that you can learn because you might find something really exciting that you, you, you weren't necessarily interested in before. So yeah, be creative, use technology where you can to um, kind of look, look around and, and, and speak to people and um, speak, to, speak to sort of employers and things like that. So yeah, just think outside the box what you normally do and, and, and look online for learning and try and yeah, encourage and learn more skills. Keep your brain alive. Vincenzo, your thoughts? I'll probably quote the, uh, the the late Steve Jobs. He said, and it's kind of it, it, it kind of matches what uh, Sancho was, was mentioning earlier on. Uh, he said, "You cannot connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So things don't always work out. Not everyone has a has a linear career progression. I haven't had one of those. But if you have a setback for any setback, you you, you need to basically regroup." and say, what do I need to do to move forward and, and keep motivated, keep positive. If you go to an interview, no one will want to talk to someone who's downbeat. Um, I know it's, it's a cliche to say, but yeah, stay positive. Yeah, it's interesting. There's um, a really interesting podcast that I contributed to recently called Squiggly Careers. And I think that, you know, careers are much more likely to be squiggly going forward than as you say, a straight line. Miranda. What, what are your thoughts? What can people do to keep, keep cheerful, but also keep applying themselves? I think going back to what we were saying about having a, a route A, B, and C, and if you end up on route B or C, to think of the plan of how you're gonna get back to A. So one of, my, one of my favorite entrepreneurs is Ursula Burns, who was the CEO of Xerox, and she was an engineer and took a position as a PA um, to the CEO and then later became the CEO and for her she said that oh. that was the way in which she got a seat at the table and there were plenty of things that we did in Bath that were that felt absolutely ridiculous with me running around the city but enabled me to gain enough traction to be able to have the conversation with much larger partners so don't worry if you're doing things that don't feel like it's the plan A, but just think about how you can use that to kind of push you back onto your B or C. Yeah, as long as you keep learning, as long as you keep learning. And Sancha, what would your advice be? Yeah, well, ditto for all of the above. Um, and on top of that, as, as I said right at the beginning, to, to just keep busy keep busy doing whatever it is that, that, that you feel passionate about, interested in, or even if it's just something that you've never done before. So one is to keep busy. And then just, just a, a small two is use this time to reflect, reflect about what you value, because what you truly value will come across in your job applications. Um, and it's that positivity and it's that 
passion that will then secure you that interview. Um, so, so yeah, we've all got more time to reflect. So reflection um, and, and, and being busy, simple as that. Oh, you could do both at the same time whilst doing a fit workout. So even better. <laughs> <laughs> but actually exercise generally does provoke a lot of fresh thinking it's one of the you know very often um observed side effects so so i'd like to thank miranda ariane vicenza and uh sancha i think what you know to me listening to all of you what's been really interesting is how many more routes to employment there are than people always see how important degrees are but how they don't have to be in a specific subject for it to match to a specific job, how important you know, personality and attitude and aptitude is, how important it is that we keep learning in every shape and form. And I think that applies to careers, you know, from the minute you enter nursery school to the, you know, the minute that you want well, even past retirement, to be honest. So, you know, the, the importance of learning to keep your brain alive, to keep interested, to keep to stay interesting is really fundamental. So I thank you all for your pragmatic and philosophical tips. I'd just like to remind everyone two weeks from today, we will be doing the third in this series, looking at resilience during a crisis. And this is both personal resilience in terms of personal well-being and also the resilience of companies. Why is it that some companies in a crisis do so much better than others? So thank you again to everybody who's contributed. Thank you to all the people working behind the scenes who made this session work. And thank you to everybody who contributed fantastic questions. And good luck in the job market. Goodbye. <laughs>